Hey, we're in a teaching series called Deeper Still. Um, and throughout this teaching series, we want to invite you to, to form and develop a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. One of the images that we used last week um, at Lincoln, and Matthew at Lincoln um, mentioned this to me. I thought it was a brilliant picture. What if you, cre- you built, you spent the energy to, to build, to dig out a pool in your backyard, and you only ever put your ankles in the water? We want to invite you to the deep end of our relationship with the Holy Spirit throughout this teaching series. And so today we're going to be talking about spiritual gifts. And to do that, we're going to be looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11. So go ahead and read with me. It'll be on the screen. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given, you could underline this if you're an underliner, for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. And to another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Well, what do we do with the Holy Spirit? Admittedly, I think sometimes we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit that's similar to how we relate to that one crazy uncle in our family. None of you are crazy uncles, I know. Uh, but you know the family reunion where you know if you, if you end up talking to him, you'll t- end up talking to him for an hour or two. And so you love him, you know you're related to him, but you stay a little bit at a distance from him. I think we do this because the Bible describes the Holy Spirit with metaphors like fire. Fire's nice, but at a distance. You get too close to fire and it feels scary. The warmth becomes hot. Uh, fire is difficult to control. Another metaphor that the, is used to describe the Holy Spirit in the Bible is wind. My wife and I, we spent a large part of our life in Ellensburg. And let me tell you, the wind is uncontrollable. There's no on and off switch. And it can knock you down on some spring days. Well, Jesus in John chapter 3 says the Spirit's like the wind. You never quite know where it's going to go and when it's going to come. And so some of us, we like control and we like on and off buttons and we like being able to put things in neat categories and neat files that allow us to know for certain when we will use it and when we need it and when it will be at our beck and call. And the Spirit says, yeah, I'm not interested in all of that. The Spirit is wind and fire. Two things that actually sometimes create full-on natural disasters. They seem uncontrollable. So sometimes we stay in the shallow end, so to speak. But the Greek Orthodox theologian Ignatius Hazim says this about the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, God is distant. Christ is in the past. The gospel is a dead letter. The church is simply an organization. Authority is domination. Mission is propaganda. Worship is summoning spirits, and Christian action is the morality of slaves. Without the Holy Spirit, church becomes a moral social club in relationship with a distant God. But with the Holy Spirit, it is the place, the primary activity, where the Spirit of God is at work forming his people into the image of 
of the Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus actually lived empowered by the Holy Spirit. You might not realize it, you might not think about it, but, but when Jesus, specifically in the Gospel of Luke, was doing his ministry, the Holy Spirit was there as well. Jesus, you could say, co-labored or partnered with the Holy Spirit while in his ministry on earth. Luke chapter 4 verse 1 says, Jesus, full of the Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Luke chapter 4 verse 14 and 15 says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in the synagogues and everyone praised him. So later on in the Gospel of John, when Jesus is with the 12 disciples and they are all on a major bummer because Jesus has said he's going to go and they're all like, no, no, don't go. Jesus says, it's actually good that I go because, because if I go, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And they're all like, I don't know if I buy it. But the point of it is, is that the same power that Jesus did his ministry with and that empowered him in his ministry, Jesus makes available to his disciples so that they might do the Jesus stuff just like Jesus did the Jesus stuff by the same power that he did the Jesus stuff with. The gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit are the way we live the power of the Spirit or power of Jesus. Spiritual though gifts. So this is available to everyone up until this present day. This is not something that had an expiration date after the early church. This is something that all followers of Jesus are invited to be empowered by the same spirit that Jesus did his ministry by. But if we're gonna step into it, if we're gonna go deeper still, we have to recognize that the spirit and specifically spiritual gifts, will challenge us. Specifically, or first, they'll challenge our Western mindset. When I say Western mindset, I don't know what comes to mind for you, but two critical pillars of the Western mindset are mine and measurable. Right? You can think about this, the idea of mine and the Western mindset you know, we see it in everything, we're, but in everything from, you know, property rights to an iPad. This is not a your pad. <laughs> this is my iPad. Kind of in a philosophical way, the Western world elevates the individual above the community. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, how some cultures elevate the community above the individual. And I'm not saying one is worse than the other. Both have problems because both involve people. But when you elevate the individual, when you have mine as a pillar of your mindset, it, is, it will be challenged when it comes to spiritual gifts. Here, let's read this verse again with me. Verse 4 in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, all the way to 6. There are different kinds of gifts, or all the way to 7. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and every one, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Maybe you didn't notice this, but nowhere does it say the spiritual gifts that you may be experiencing or God might be using to work in and through you are yours in a possessive way. It isn't completely theologically accurate to use the language, though it's popular, of my spiritual gifts. Because it begs the question, are they yours? Because this passage of scripture says they come from God and they're for others. So the problem with saying, well, my spiritual gifts, though in some ways it makes sense, 
confuses the issue and makes us think they're something that I possess. They're from God, they're for others. So spiritual gifts challenges the idea of mine because they originate outside of me and their goal is outside of me. And also, spiritual gifts challenge the Western pillar of measurable. What I mean by measurable is oftentimes we think of something only true things have processed or made their way through the scientific method. Hypothesis, conclusion, testing. But I would suggest to you that if you employ the scientific method to all of life, you will have a diminished life rather than an expanded life. In fact, you will be limiting your approach to life to what some call scientism. Now, scientism is different from science. Science is a great gift from God given to all of us to understand God's creation. Scientism is using the scientific method to understand all of reality. And so Nancy Piercy, the, the writer and thinker, says this about scientism. Scientism is not science. Rather, scientism is an ideology that reduces all knowledge to science and its methods. Think about this. The most important truths in the world cannot be reduced, but demand to be expanded. The birth of a child. The process of giving birth to a kiddo. And the, the process of bringing the, the child to your chest. Try to tell me, or try to tell you, if you've been through a journey like that, that it's merely biology. And that it only, only, the only way to understand it is by biochemistry and biological functions. If you do that, if you, use, if you only use the language of science to describe the experience of giving birth to a child, you diminish the experience when it should be expanded. Similarly, with falling in love. Can you say that it is, yeah, there's endorphins and serotonin and other neurochemicals that are working together to, to help us fall in love? Absolutely. But should we say that's all it is? In no way. The feeling of awe. The feeling of awe as the northern lights are available from your doorstep. The experience of I have to take a picture to somehow remember this. Is it merely a biological or naturalistic phenomenon? I think if we're honest, we feel somehow cheated if we diminish it to a naturalistic explanation. You cannot fit the most powerful truths in our life into a test tube. They demand to be expanded rather than reduced. And the same is true for spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts in verses 9 and 10 uh, particularly challenge our measurable Western mindset because they are words we would usually describe as miraculous. There's the gift of healing. There's miraculous powers, straight up. There's prophecy. There's distinguishing between spirits. There's speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues. All of these things do not fit neatly in the language of science. Like giving birth and falling in love and awe, they demand a new vocabulary. And because of that, they challenge our Western mindset. We want to, we want to often distance ourselves from some of those miraculous gifts 
because we don't know how to control them. But the Spirit beckons us deeper still. The Spirit beckons us, let your guard down, I am good. In this area, I want to suggest to those of us that kind of wrestle with these mine and measurable ways of limiting our understanding of spiritual gifts that we learn from the global church. You see, the non-Western church, well, just in fact, the Christianity is not a Western religion. It's a Middle Eastern religion. From the Jewish tradition that was really founded in, the, in modern day Palestine. And so to understand it, we might need to talk to friends from non-Western places. Folks that maybe grew up overseas. People that spent time as missionaries overseas. Reading books from people that have thought deeply and reflected deeply on Christian truth. That have spent time, uh, you know, seeing God work in different ways. We need to become learners if we're going to go deeper still. Because the best of our resources lead us to where we currently are. Deeper still means we need to talk to the people that have been in the depths. The people that have seen. The people that have not tried to limit or constrain. And sometimes that will challenge our belief or our understanding. No doubt it will. But the challenge is actually a good thing if we're to let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. Also, spiritual gifts will challenge our ego. They'll challenge our ego. When you read through the passage that we've looked at and we're looking at, there you won't see a reference to a stage or to the elevation of certain gifts or the downplaying of others. Uh, each Sunday, um, we have prayer stations um, on the side of, of the space. And I, um, I, I'm, I'm actually, I believe that, you know, I have a high view of preaching. I, I, I'm biased, you know. Um, I got a high view of preaching. Um, I think something happens, you know, as you open God's word, you teach God's word. God, God, God does stuff in that space, changes our understanding, forms us. It's, it's a beautiful, good thing. Um, but I think some of the greatest ministry happens off of the stage. So these, these prayer stations, I, I've made a habit, you know, since we started having these prayer stations available after the teaching on both sides of the, the building, I've made a habit of going to them because I know that, you know, it, it's always awkward for someone to go first because you're thinking, well, if I go to the prayer stations, then people will think something big's happening in my life. And... Well, yeah, something is big happening in my life, but I don't want anybody to think somebody big is happening in my life. So I'm going to stay where I am and not go to the prayer stations and get the prayer I need because I want to look good in front of the people I don't know. So I'm trying to break the mold because I know we all wrestle with this. So I'm, I go to the prayer stations, and oftentimes it's kind of comical because the people, hey, how can I pray for you? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm here because I'm a pastor and I want people to feel comfortable going to the prayer stations. And <laughs> now you know. Um, I, one time, I, it was a few months ago, I go and I go do my shtick, you know, um, and uh, the man praying with me, uh, he asked, hey, can I put my hand on your shoulder? I'm like, yeah, it's fine. Um, he's praying for me, and he says, hey, this, he talks about this picture that's just showing up his head as he's praying. And I, I tell you what, what he shared with me this, this image that came to his mind as he's praying, it knocked me between the eyes. That night I, I spent time I, journaling through what he shared and how he n had no knowledge of how that spoke to something of critical significance. He did not, he was not briefed. There was not an intelligence form that he had before I walked up. But the Spirit of God gave him an image. And I've, I've honestly, I've spent time journaling through that since that day. 
the spirit of God, his gift, the gifts that the spirit brings will challenge our ego because oftentimes the greatest work the spirit does, it's, it's not in a place of public notoriety. You see, some of the most powerful gifts are used off of the stage and out of the lights and some of the most Christ-like activities demonstrate in obscurity and hiddenness. The ego wants compensation. The ego wants recognition. The ego wants a stage. The Holy Spirit just says, will you partner with me? Irrespective of where it is and when it is and who's watching. That's why in verse 7, Paul says, Now to each one of the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. It's, it's, it's not about the ego. It's about the other. Paul wants us to understand this. So spiritual gifts, another way to say it, a, 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 a big ego, spiritual gifts with a big ego creates a spiritual disaster. Another way to say this is Spiritual gifts without spiritual fruit leads to a spiritual disaster. And that's unfortunate that we still are finding stories of, of uh, folks that have, are finding this reality out the tough way. You see, Paul, when he's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he's actually rebuking the Corinthians because they have this misunderstanding of how spiritual gifts should be used they think it's about becoming influencers and becoming powerful, becoming notoriety, and being, being great and in the eyes and being, being, you know, puffing your chest out. But that's the way of the world in spiritual clothing. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is something, admittedly, you maybe have your grandma cross-stitched you, you know, or maybe it was read at your wedding because it's all this stuff about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. But really, Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 is rebuking the Corinthians for doing spiritual gifts according to the pattern of the world. That's why he says, you dummies. It's my translation. If you don't have love, you're just a clanging symbol. What's the point? If it's about your ego. It's for the common good. Spiritual gifts challenge our Western mindset and they challenge the ego. But they develop in community. We know where we are gifted and where we aren't in community. At times, if I'm to be honest, I'm too insecure to even say, I think God might be wanting to use me in this way. Unless I have somebody else Tell me, I think God might be wanting to use you in that way. By myself, I feel a little insecure and anxious about saying those words. But with another person drawing the gold out of me, I'm able to say, maybe God does want to use me in that way. And similarly, sometimes in arrogance, I think God certainly wants to use me in this way. And I need community to say, we're not quite sure if God wants to use you in that way. <laughs> Years ago, when I was a college student, I had long hair down to here, um, and I played a djembe drum. You know what a djembe drum is? <laughs> it was the early 2000s. Don't fault me too much. It's this, uh, it's this African drum that's shaped like an hourglass, and I tried to join all of these different worship bands. And I would, you know... Kind of, hey, you want, me, you want me to play my djembe drum? And, you know, it's used this weird trend. You know, first time, everybody's like, yeah. Second time, nah, you know. <laughs> and I remember a mentor of mine saying at one point, Brian, I think you are so gifted. You got so many great gifts. And I don't know if rhythm is one of them. <laughs> and it may sound a little harsh, but I tell you what, it was very generous. Because if, if I wasn't particularly gifted there, it wasn't a good use of my time. 
And it's not about being on the stage anyways. We only learn this in community. Sometimes I'm insecure. Sometimes I'm arrogant. I need community to help me identify where God might be using me. Are you in community? Not just do you come to Anchor Church regularly, but are you in community? It's not only, though, that we, we know where we are gifted when we are in community, but we begin to learn how to grow in our gifts when we are in community. Every quarter, we do these things called Seek First Nights, where we, we, we come with expectation that God would move through the power of his spirit. We usually have them on Sunday nights. Keep, keep up to speed on when, when the next one is. Um, but oftentimes, a prayer team, there'll be a prayer team training right before that. And Pastor Susan will work with our, the prayer team saying, hey, here's how you pray uh, with people that come up and say they want prayer. Here's what happens when a scripture comes, when when, if a scripture comes to mind, here's how you share that with them. You don't share it by saying, God wants you to memorize the scripture and it's gonna change your life. You just present it as, hey, this came to mind. I wanna offer it to you as something to reflect on. Maybe, maybe the Lord wants to use it in your life. You learn and, and many more ways of learning how to pray for other people. But it would be one thing to get the training, but the next, right after that, there's the seek first night where people are coming in for prayer. And because it's community, we get to learn how to pray for each other and listen to God on one another's behalf. It wouldn't happen if it wasn't in community. Because spiritual gifts are from God and for others, the prerequisite is God and others. Spiritual gifts cannot be practiced in a vacuum. They need community. I had a funny journey with this, if I, you'll just permit me. Um, I went to a small church when I was a college student because it was connected to the school where I was leading Young Life. And um, very small church, country church, maybe about 25 on the Sundays. And I disciplined myself to love it. Um, and, and the pastor there, who I do love, I dearly love, said, Brian, I'd love to have you preach. I was a new Christian. Never really preached. I'd only listened to a few sermons myself. Um, and so uh, I, <laughs> I preached, a, I, I ended up preaching a sermon. He didn't give me a lot of guidance. I um, ended up preaching a sermon, and I, I had re misread the passage the whole time I was preparing for it. So I thought Paul was saying, be untied in love. And I thought that was a brilliant metaphor. Paul, the genius, free with your love, hide it under a bushel, no. I found out after I preached the sermon, after people were studying their Bible <laughs> diligently, and the person that led communion that morning was crying, I thought I, I, thought I was ready to spike the Bible. I thought, God, the revival is clearly happening. But later on, my friend asked me, hey, what translation were you using? <laughs> and I told him, uh, the NIV, why? Did something stir up in your life? Maybe we can talk about it. You know, he said, yeah, maybe for you, though, if you want to read it again. Um, so I read it again, and for the first time, I didn't read Untied. I read United. <laughs> I preached the sermon to all my friends I invited and the rest of the church on what it meant to be untied in love. And... <laughs> Here, Paul was talking about being united in love. <laughs> I've grown a lot since then. <laughs> Here's the thing. Before I, before, I thought, before I realized that, before I found that out, I thought I was the king. I thought I was the best. And after I found that out, I thought I was a jester. I thought I was the worst. What I needed was community. Community. I needed a community to know that, yeah, you were never as high as you thought you were and you're not as low as you think you are. You're a person that's gifted and is growing in the gifts and there's a long journey ahead of you. You might discover a gift for hospitality 
at the front doors of the ch this church, as your smile helps a person walk from the outside to the inside. You might discover a gift for hospitality. Yeah, the hospitality is not mentioned as a spiritual gift, but I have this expansive, I think, view of the spiritual gifts that anything that is in alignment with the ministry of Jesus that is empowered by the Spirit could be described as a spiritual gift. You, could, you might discover the gift of hospitality as you're making coffee and you're praying over the people that are going to be coming in that morning. You might discover the gift of teaching on a Sunday morning at Anchor Students or in the Anchor Kids Elementary class. And in no way is that the zenith or the high point of the, your use of the spirit, those spiritual gifts. It may be the beginning, but you discover it in community. We have, uh, I think, done a really good job of making people feel comfortable here and saying, you don't have to serve, we don't need you. And the truth is, that's absolutely true. You don't have to serve, we don't need you, but we definitely want you to serve. And I think even more, when you serve, you discover things about yourself and how God has wired you, and you meet other people. And other people sometimes say, I saw God work through you there. Or they lift you up when you make a boneheaded choice when you're using your gifts or working in the ministry. We need each other. So I would ask, I, I meant, we mentioned this already, but take the connection card. This is not the, yeah, 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 they say it every Sunday. Take this connection card. And on the back it says, I want to join a serve team. If you are not currently serving, but you anchor as your church, I would just ask you as your pastor to do that. Not because, oh, we're desperate, we're desperate, please, please, please. But because it's in those spaces where we step into community where we start to discover how God wants to use us. The worship team can come on up. Um, and those helping with communion and prayer can come on up as well. And I, but I just would like to pay, possibly zoom out a little bit on this topic. And just kind of maybe collectively just to find ourselves in a place of imagination and wonder as we look and understand the fact that God is a gift-giving God. God is a gift-giving God. It's God's choice how he wanted to be. He could do whatever he wanted. He could be whoever he wants. He's God. He could be distant and withdrawn. He could be withholding. He could be mean and finger-wagging. He could be shame-inducing. But instead, he's a gift-giving God. He's a God, his disposition towards us is towards giving us something that could be used for another, which is who God is. What he has, he offers. And what he offers to us, he asks us to offer to others. We see this idea of gift giving in two places. One is the cross, where Jesus Christ gave us the gift of grace and endured the loss unimaginable so that we might be included so that for a brief time he was fully excluded. But then also we see this gift of grace or this gift from God in the spirit that wants to work within you. Some of you might want to go to the prayer stations today and just say, I just want to know how God wants to work through me, the gifts he's wanting to use. Some of you might go to the prayer stations and say, hey, I've been kind of trapping God in my Western mindset. God, I want to let God be God on God's terms. Your invitation is to deeper, deeper in the love of God, deeper in the power of God. And so as we step into the song, I just want to pray over us. So spirit of the living God, come, arrest our hearts, draw us up, cast us down, cause us to do whatever you know we need so that we might grow in a deepening understanding of your love that is powerful and your power that is loving. 
We pray these things in the unrivaled name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, come.